Well, I'm excited to share with you all this morning. Uh, this is the story that we're going to be looking at today is one of my favorites in the Bible. I say that a lot. I have a few favorite stories. But this one's like probably in the top five, I would say, if I had to rank them. And it is the story about the, the Magi or the wise men or the three kings. There's lots of different ways to talk about them. And so I'm really pumped to, to share a little bit of my thoughts about this with you all this morning. And hopefully we can leave here um, different than when we came in. I encourage you all to be open to what God may want to speak to you. Um, a dis- another, another way to talk about a disciple, which I hope we're all trying to be uh, and we want to be, is that we are disciples of Jesus. A disciple is basically a learner. A disciple is someone who, who wants to learn and grow from their teacher. And our teacher is Jesus. And so we're going to sit and we're going to learn together about Jesus and fo- learn better how to follow his example today. And so I'm going to read our text for this morning. So if you want to follow along in an actual Bible, there are Bibles there in your pews, but we also have the Scripture on the screen. For those of you at home, it will be on the screen as well, and so y'all can follow along. It's Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And as you can see, we still have our Christmas decorations up because we have not stopped celebrating Christmas just yet. Uh, This will be our last Sunday looking at the Christmas story um, and you, you may know this, but there are two versions of the Christmas story in the Bible, in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew. They both kind of have a different way of looking at it. And so um, we're going to be looking at part of the story in Matthew. And so I'm going to read all this for us. It's a few verses, but it's really rich with lots of interesting things. And so I'm going to read it, all of it for us, all 12 verses. So after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, During the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the peoples, chief priests, and teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Messiah? Or he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, uh, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, And they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. So let me offer a quote uh, to guide our story for this morning. This is by... um, author Ruth Haley Barton. She says, The story of the Magi is a story of pilgrimage. It is about being willing to leave that which is familiar in order to arrive at our deeper spiritual home. It is about seeking something we don't fully understand until we stumble upon it where we least expect it. Let me read that one more time. The story of the Magi is a story of pilgrimage. It is about being willing to leave that which is familiar in order to arrive at our deeper spiritual home. It is about seeking something we don't fully understand until we stumble upon it where we least expect it. I have a question for you. Have you ever experienced a moment in your life when you felt called to leave behind something that was familiar or comfortable, or easy, and embark on a difficult journey into the unknown. Have y'all had moments like this in your lives? Perhaps you quit your job to pursue 
a more healthy and life-giving path. Or maybe you felt led to pack up and move to another place, not even sure what you would do when you got there. Perhaps you decided to leave an abusive relationship and reclaim your dignity and your value and your worth. Maybe you admitted you had an addiction and you made a decision to get treatment. Maybe you felt God leading you to get involved in some kind of movement for justice and you just jumped in and learned and grew from that experience. Perhaps you decided to have a hard conversation with someone you love, not knowing how it would affect the future of your relationship. Maybe you decided to let go of some long-held beliefs about God or about yourself so that you could reimagine a spirituality that is more life-giving and healthy and whole. You know, I imagine many of us have experienced these kind of defining moments in our lives, these times in our lives when we felt called to leave behind that which is familiar or comfortable and embark on a risky journey into the unknown. You know, in many ways, this past couple of years, living in this pandemic, just deciding to move forward and to keep trying to stay committed to each other and to ourselves and to our families and to our church, um, that, in many ways, that's been a risky journey for some of us. And it's been a journey into the unknown, right? It's taken great courage for us to not give up, right? To keep trying, to keep clinging to each other, to keep moving forward together, even though we have no clue what our world will look like in six months. This story about the Magi, like I said, is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And there are so many layers to this story, and, and because of that, I've had a really hard time uh, this week deciding how to engage with this story. Um, my favorite stories are the hardest to preach on, to be honest, because I love so much about them, and I can't decide what to say, and I can't say it all, or we might be here for a long time, and I don't want to do that to you. Um, so I, I was sitting here this week really having a hard time figuring out what to focus on, and on Thursday of this week, I was spending some time just in prayer and thinking through it, and I, kind of this inner voice was speaking to me basically saying, John, share what's on your heart. How is this story speaking to you right now? So right now, at the start of this new year, I feel strangely similar to how I felt at the start of last year. Um, I don't know if y'all feel the same way. It feels like it's kind of just a cruel repeat of what we were doing last year at this time. Um, a little bit different, um, but I, just like last year, I have no idea uh, what this year is going to be like. I kind of feel like anything could happen. I mean, on a personal level, um, at our church, in our community, in our nation, I feel like anything could happen. And for me, being an Enneagram 6, if you know what that means, uh, the idea that anything could happen is a bit frightening to me. It's a little bit scary. Um, one thing that's on my mind this year um, is, is my foster care journey that my wife and I have been on for a while now. Um, we're foster parents, as some of you, a lot of you know. Um, and as some of you know, we've opened our home again um, this year uh, for another foster care placement, and we're just waiting on a call at this point. Um, last February, about a year ago, we welcomed this beautiful baby boy who uh, you all knew as Baby C into our home, and we just cherish those few months that we got to spend with him before he returned to his mom in July last year. And for those months that followed when he went back to his mom, we were feeling a lot of different emotions. On the one hand, we felt so grateful that he was able to go back home um, because that's, that's the goal, right? And, and we were so grateful that he was healthy at a good place that he could go back home to be with his family. Um, but we also, as you can expect, experienced a lot of grief, um, really profound grief, because we love him so much and we miss him dearly. You know, and I, I think for me, as I think about opening our home again for another placement, it feels very exciting, um, but it also feels very scary um, and very risky. I feel like once again, we're leaving behind that which is familiar and comfortable to embark on a risky journey, um, much of which is outside of our control. And I wonder if any of you are feeling similar to the way I'm feeling this morning. Um, maybe you're beginning the new year embarking on a journey into kind of unknown, unknown territory. 
And so I just wonder, uh, and y'all can think about this, what's coming to your mind right now as you think of your own life? You know, the, the Magi in this story, I'd never fully considered this story from their perspective. And I was trying to put myself in the story and think about them and what they were experiencing. They took a risky journey to a foreign land, to a dangerous place ruled by a paranoid violent king. They traveled to an unknown place with no clear idea on where they were headed. And and I just wonder as I'm reading this story, what drove them to take that risk? What was it that compelled them to take that journey? Perhaps God was stirring deep within their hearts, much like God has stirred in our hearts at different times in our lives, compelling us, inspiring us, prompting us to take a risk to become more of the people that God has created us to be. You know, sometime after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it could have been weeks, months, uh, years, we're not completely sure, um, God was doing something in the east, it says. God was stirring things up in the east. There was this group of people called Magi who likely lived in what we would call modern-day Iraq today. They probably weren't kings, as the song says, Uh, They may have been leaders of some kind. We also don't know how many of them there were. They brought three gifts, so legend says maybe there were three. Um, But we do know uh, that they were likely astrologers, meaning they were able to look to the sky and gain wisdom and insight to the stars, to the moon, to the planets. We also know that they were Gentiles. They were not Jewish. They were outsiders to the faith of Jesus and all those in Israel. I imagine that they were seekers, that they were learners. I imagine they were deeply spiritual people. They saw, think about it, they saw this peculiar star in the sky, and for some reason they believed deep down within their spirits that that star was a sign of something new, something great, something world-changing. In one way or another, they discerned that that star had risen for the new king of the Jews. And so compelled by God, they embarked on a risky journey to see where that star would lead them. Now, not being sure where to go, uh, they naturally went to the capital city of Israel, Jerusalem, the place where the king lived. If you're looking for the new king, it makes sense to go to the capital, right, where the political power was located. They were able to get access to King Herod and have a conversation with him, and they inquired about this new king of the Jews. Then they told the current paranoid King Herod that they wanted to worship this new king that had been born. Now perhaps they were naive or uninformed or just really bold, but you've got to imagine that the current king of the Jews uh, was not very happy uh, that they had come to worship the new king of the Jews. Telling the king this would be a very risky thing for them to do. And the text tells us that when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. Now, he was deeply disturbed in all of Jerusalem with him, it says. Now, it shouldn't be difficult for us to imagine why King Herod might be disturbed by this news. If you know anything about Herod from history, he was a very paranoid king. He had many sons who tried to take his throne from him. He killed his own family members if he suspected they were plotting against him. He was not well loved, and he was not very secure in his leadership, and so hearing about a new king would greatly trouble him. Now, not only was Herod troubled, but it says that all of Jerusalem with him was troubled. Now, I would think that the people in Jerusalem might be excited, right, about a new king because Herod was such a bad king. But you got to think that uh, these people probably knew that transfers of power were rarely peaceful. We are very fortunate that most of the time in America, transfers of power have happened relatively peaceful. Last year wasn't all that peaceful, um, but compared to what they were facing back then, it was. They were probably worried about the possibility of civil war, of violence, of disruption to their lives. It's interesting that this baby boy (laughs) was causing quite the anxiety among all the powerful people in Jerusalem. Now, Herod was paranoid, 
but he was also smart and he was very politically savvy. And so what he did is he called in these religious folks. We could call them maybe his religious yes men uh, to help him figure out where this possible political opponent was supposed to be born. And so these religious leaders knew some Jewish prophecies. They were Jewish leaders themselves. And these prophecies pointed to the town of Bethlehem. And so Herod asked the Magi to go to Bethlehem so that they could find this new king. And he told them, he's like, hey, you go to Bethlehem, you find the new king, and you come back and you tell me where he's at because I want to worship him too, just like you all. And of course, Herod was lying. Herod was politically savvy. He wanted to do damage to this king and ensure that no one rose to take his throne. And so the Magi left Jerusalem and they traveled to Bethlehem. Now eventually they found the place where Joseph, Mary, and Jesus were staying. And the text says when they found it that they were overjoyed. Now there's an interesting contrast there between their willingness to go to Bethlehem. They were overjoyed and then thinking about the religious leaders in Jerusalem. It's interesting to me, but not surprising, that the religious leaders in Jerusalem who were tight with Herod, they didn't go to Bethlehem to check it out. They didn't move a muscle. They knew the prophecies about Bethlehem, but they had no interest in going to check it out for themselves. It's just fascinating to me that they immediately brought this prophecy about Bethlehem, the coming Messiah. They heard about the star, They brought it all to Herod, but they didn't have any interest in going to check it out for themselves. You would think that the religious leaders would want to go to Bethlehem to see if the Messiah was truly there, but they didn't move an inch. But we know how this goes because too often people know the truth and it makes no impact on their lives. Too often I know the truth and it makes no impact on my life. But the outsiders, these Gentile uh, Magi, these strange, ridiculed, often uh, pagans, they heard God's call and they responded. They were open to where God wanted to lead them. Yet the comfortable religious people, they stayed in Jerusalem and their nice places and they did nothing. You know, there's a difference, I think, between looking religious, claiming to be religious, doing all the things, and actually being a deeply spiritual person. They didn't travel uh, empty-handed, these magi. They brought gifts to the family. Um, I've heard some people joking about that, that they didn't really, you you wouldn't want to invite them to a baby shower uh, because their gifts for the baby weren't quite so helpful. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? Um, But they brought these gifts to the family. They're likely symbolic in what they were bringing in many ways. And then they bowed down and they worshiped Jesus. Gentiles, outsiders, already worshiping Jesus at the beginning of the gospel story. This says what God's heart is all about. This is pointing to what God's heart is all about. So Joseph and Mary, I think it's such a beautiful scene that they welcomed in these visitors into their home. Um, They probably would have been a little taken off guard by these strange men showing up to their house. They welcomed them in. They showed them hospitality and love. And the visitors showed hospitality and love to Joseph and Mary by bringing gifts to them. It's this beautiful picture of inclusion and welcome and love. Jews and Gentiles worshiping and honoring Jesus together. You know, we couldn't help but notice the the stark contrast this year between what happened last year on Epiphany. Many Christians typically read and celebrate this story on Epiphany, which is often in the West celebrated on January 6th. And what a sharp contrast this story is to the events that happened in D.C. on January 6th, a place where people were flying, you know, Christian flags and banners with Jesus' name on it. And that was not the type of event that we're reading about here, this event of people coming together and showing love and welcome and care for one another. So the story ends on a frightening note. As the Magi slept in Bethlehem the night before they departed, the Lord appeared to them in a dream warning them not to go back to Herod. The text says they left their home by another way. Because we know that Herod uh, had lied to them and Herod was probably going to end up doing great harm to the Holy Family and potentially to the Magi if they had returned back to Jerusalem. You know, the Magi, as I think about them, they refused to let the challenges and the fears 
and the risk stopped them from seeking Jesus. They felt this stirring within them, and they made sacrifices. They took a long journey. They defied laws. They risked danger, and they gave of themselves in order to worship and live for Jesus. They took faithful and loving steps, having no idea what the consequences might be, but they did it anyways. You know, last year I saw this post on Facebook by A guy I admire greatly named John Wilson Hartgrove, who does a a wonderful ministry in Durham, North Carolina. He's worked a lot with Reverend Barber and the Poor People's Campaign. And and, and this just stuck out to me, and and I revisited it this year. It came up as a memory for me. And he says that, having seen through Herod's scheme to cling to power through lies, violence, and false piety, the Magi went home by another way. Like them, we pray in this season for a better way home, to wholeness, to justice, and to peace. You know, the predominant way of things in our world is lies, greed, selfishness, violence, judgment. And I pray that we, Embrace Church, can take the better path this year, the path of honesty and of sharing and of sacrifice and of peace and of compassion. I want to read a a quote by my new favorite Bible scholar. His name's Ched Myers. And he's making a comparison with this story to a story that we find in Exodus. It's a long quote, but he says it so well, I don't want to summarize it. I just want to read his words. He says, these actions, he's talking about the Magi, these actions of holy obedience are at the same time risky acts of political disobedience. And call to mind a second story from the Hebrew Bible. Exodus 1 through 2 narrates the birth of Moses, whose life is also threatened by a paranoid ruler and similarly saved by an underground railroad. The parallels between Pharaoh and Herod are uncanny. The challenge of an infant unleashes a policy of infanticide, justified, of course, by national security. Royal attempts to work through accomplices, Pharaoh's Hebrews midwives and Herod's astrologers. These royal attempts fail, however, because these characters choose life and are prepared to deceive their superiors in order to protect the innocent. We never hear again of these midwives and astrologers, yet upon their acts of costly conscience hangs the whole of the biblical drama. Dare we assume that our own choices, minor players though we be, are any less consequential. In the birth narratives of both Moses and Jesus, ordinary people resist authority in order to protect life. In Exodus, the Hebrew midwives, uh, if you all know that story, were told to kill all the baby boys. Yet two women, Shifra and Puah, felt a stirring within them to choose life and to protect the children that Pharaoh wanted to kill. And this costly and risky decision set in motion the liberation of the entire people of Israel from slavery. What a powerful story. The Magi felt a stirring within them to travel a dangerous and risky journey in search of Jesus, the Messiah. Multiple times they defied Herod's orders and chose life to protect Jesus and his family. Their costly decision to choose another way provided a path for Jesus to eventually provide liberation for the entire world. Ruth Haley Barton describes the Magi as, she she says they're mystics, and, and I love how she describes what a mystic is. She says, mystics are those who have a longing for God that is so profound that they make radical choices to seek God and respond to God's leading in their lives. As German theologian Karl Rayner famously points out, the Christian of the future will either be a mystic or will not exist at all. I love that. She says that mystics are those who have a longing for God that is so profound that they make radical choices to seek God and respond to God's leading in their lives. I think all of us are called as followers of Jesus. We're called by God to make radical choices to seek God 
and respond to God's leading in our lives. And if we are to navigate the perilous times in which we live, we need to draw inspiration and courage from those who have come before us. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, as we were reminded on All Saints Day, and the Magi are great examples. Ordinary people who responded to God's leading and had the courage to travel a risky journey in search of peace and freedom and love. And their journey brought many challenges. Likely some pain probably scared them to death. Yet their journey also brought them immense joy and life, and it provided blessing for others. You know, as I'm thinking about this new year, I have a lot of fears and a lot of worries. I'm concerned for myself about possible grief and sadness. I'm often prone to choose the easy and safe path. Is anyone with me on that? Yet I sense God stirring in me to try to make some radical choices to seek God and respond to God's leading in my life. I sense God calling me to take the risk to love to love myself, to love God, to love others. You know, God never promises us that life will be easy, and I promise you it will not be easy this year. (laughs) Yet God does promise that he will walk with us, guiding us by his light. I'll close by just reminding you of part of this story that is very important, and that's the star. (laughs) There is a star in this story, and we don't need to forget the star. The Magi had the star to guide them. And the star is the sign of God's light and guidance in the darkness. God doesn't leave us alone. So as you all face another really hard year and try to discern what radical choices that you will make to seek God, we got to remember the star, God's sign of his light and his guidance through dark times. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We're going to share communion this morning.